Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education business meeting. The date is Thursday, August 15th, 2024. Can we call the attendance, please? Yes. Mr. Kelleher? Here. Ms. Leong? Here. Ms. Uh, Ms. Tarpinian? Here. Uh, Ms. Lindstrom? Here. Uh, Ms. Peterson? Here. And Ms. Trapini Huff? Here. Would everyone please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item 11.3, sorry. Um, I would like to add an 11.3.8, which would be the fall uh, sport coaches. Um, so do I have a motion? Second. So oh. moved. <laughs> and second? Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have a first and we have a second to add, um, to amend the agenda to add 11.3.8, which is the fall sport coaches. All in favor? And it's unanimous, thank you. All right, um, agenda item 6.0 is the superintendent's report, so I'll turn that over to Diane. Great, good evening everyone. Um, excited to be here tonight. Uh, we are gearing up for back to school. Uh, in less than two weeks, we will be welcoming our students back and we're really excited about that. Uh, just wanted to provide you with some updates of what's been happening um, since we last met in July. Uh, so first off, we have some amazing work that has been happening in our buildings uh, to prepare them for return. Uh, we are so fortunate to have year-round staff um, in several different departments that help us to be ready to greet students in August. And um, yesterday, we actually had a summer cookout to recognize those folks. We do that every year. On an annual basis, our central office leadership team um, helps with all of the cooking, and it is just wonderful to be able to acknowledge uh, that staff. Um, as I said to all of them yesterday, uh, they are the least visible individuals in the district, uh, but without them, we really wouldn't be able to move forward. So uh, it was really nice to be able to just come together uh, uh, for food and um, for you know some low-level recognition, but uh, I think it's really important for every member of our organization to know that we see them. Um, last week, we held our leadership retreat uh, for two days for our leadership team uh, with a focus on uh, moving action plans forward for the coming year and setting goals for our work. Uh, that was a great time. We've got, uh, you know, uh, some new members of our team, and it's always nice to be able to come together and um, have some team building and uh, frame things so that we're aligned and moving in the same direction. So that was a, a, a really um, important time for our team. Uh, our new staff orientation is coming up next Wednesday, and uh, we will also hold a new staff symposium opportunity on um, Thursday for those people who are interested um, in attending. Katie Vitro has been heading that up for us so that as new staff come on board, they feel like they are knowledgeable about um, you know, some of the key aspects of the work here in Scarborough. Um, opening days for staff are coming right up on uh, Monday, August 26th and Tuesday, August 27th. Um, our district level day will be August 27th. A couple of years ago when we moved to the two-day model for professional development for staff, um, some of the feedback that we got from staff was that they really preferred to have a school-based day the first day and district opening the second day. And um, certainly having been a classroom teacher, uh, I can appreciate that 
you know, top of mind is, you know, who are the students in your class? Are your things organized? Are you set up? Uh, versus coming to a district breakfast and an opening. So we had made that shift a couple years ago, and that really has been a welcome one. Um, so I would just extend uh, this as an invitation to the board if you'd like to join us for our district opening um, on the 27th. That will be um, in the auditorium at the high school at 8 a.m. Um, and we have a fabulous guest speaker. Um, she is... Um, uh, a national speaker and author. Her name is Jill Seiler, and um, she's already been working with our leadership team, and we're excited for her to bring her messaging to the staff. Um, also coming up, as we gear up for back to school, um, our by appointment days for kindergarten through fifth grade families uh, will be happening on August 28th and 29th. So hopefully folks um, should have that information now and know when their appointments are and um, feeling really excited to uh, get to know their child's teacher. Uh, the first day for grade six and grade nine will happen on Wednesday the 28th. And on Thursday the 29th will be the first school day uh, for grades six through 12. And then when we come back from uh, the Labor Day weekend, uh, all of our students will be in session. So we're really excited um, because, again, not that it isn't exciting to do all the work and planning in the summer, uh, but it certainly is a very different job for us in the summer than it is in the school year. Um, you know, we're here for students, and so it seems like a different place when we don't have kids around. Uh, so we're excited for that. Uh, also wanted to just uh, share out with you at a very high level this evening uh, the articulation of work um, as we defined it uh, for our leadership council last week. Um, as you know, all of our schools um, set action plans and goals for their work during the year. And so in terms of uh, the right timing for this, uh, this is generally something that is included as part of our leadership retreat so that uh, we can all be aligned in a vertical way. And then um, schools have the ability to go back and do some planning with their own school teams about, you know, what does that mean for them at the school level? So um, articulation of these goals with defined action steps and measurable outcomes is something that will happen at the school level. Um, but, uh, you know, I will not read those things word for word, uh, but I don't think that there are anything, there's nothing on that list that should be a surprise. Um, we have been engaging in some really important work, and we know that um, as we do that, uh, those are multi-year plans and things that take time. So uh, if you take a look up there, you'll see that our first goal is really around um, developing and implementing a plan that addresses our facility constraints relative to community growth and student programming. Um, so, you know, some of you might say, oh, that means um, uh, addressing the primary school and the middle school. And that is partially a yes, but I think it is also just as important um, for our schools like Wentworth and the high school, uh, for us to kind of keep our eye on the apple and make sure that uh, the way in which our uh, facilities are organized and how we're using our spaces really match what our student needs are. Our uh, second goal is around uh, refining and monitoring a multi-tiered system of support, ensuring equitable access to resources so that we can make sure that uh, we're really um, attending to uh, maximizing academic growth and personal well-being for each and every one of our students. Uh, we've been working on um, our MTSS plans over time, and I think we're uh, really wanting to make sure that we have uh, opportunities at all levels uh, that are equitable. And um, so our schools will be working on that. And then our last goal, um, again, is around, um, you know, uh, making sure that we're fostering an, a welcoming um, and inclusive school environment um, by prioritizing um, a social-emotional learning approach 
and um, looking through that with a DEI lens. So um, last year was the first year uh, for some really important work at our K-8 with the implementation of our mind up and, um, oh my gosh, why am I drawing a blank? Ruler. Ruler. Thank you. Um, <laughs> curriculums. And so, you know, uh, that was just year one of that work. And so we'll be moving that work forward. And we have been having really specific conversations about what is that next step to take with diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as it relates to different you know, at the school level um, and looking at equity teams and how can we start disaggregating some data around, um, you know, what things are looking like for our students. So we're really excited um, to, to be able to move that work forward. Um, and we'll be reporting back to you uh, with more detail as the year unfolds. Um, also wanted to provide uh, the community this evening just an update on our track. Uh, this was a question that came forward and we uh, understand that um, we did get approval through referendum uh, for an updated turf and track, um, I guess three years ago now. And um, at the time we did move forward on uh, the turf component. Um, but what I've outlined for you here, and again, many thanks to Kate Bolton, who's um, really been um, helping us with some of this work in terms of uh, uh, being the connection point for this piece. There really are two reasons why uh, we have not yet been able to move forward with the track renovation. The first is around strategic facilities planning. Um, those of you who have been on the board uh, probably recall that um, in 2022, uh, the board had released information about deferring the track because there was some strategic planning happening about where a, a, a potential land might be um, if there uh, was a decision to build another school facility. Um, the turf component of that was done during that time uh, because the vendor uh, was very clear with us that the turf components could actually be reused in a different location. So we could have rolled it right up and brought it somewhere else um, if we felt like there was a need to do that. Um, and then in the winter of 2023, the building steering committee at the time determined that uh, the location of our athletic complex would not be uh, sufficient um, for any um, proposed building project. And um, after that decision was made, our district team um, mobilized to try to get on a schedule for track renovation. And um, you know, the desire was to do that in the summer of 2023. Um, and that brings us to number two, which is another the other reason why this has not yet come to fruition, which is there is a very highly competitive market for this type of specialized construction. And so uh, we issued an RFP in the spring of 2023 and there were only two vendors in our region who uh, qualified to provide this type of specialized work, both of whom um, were already committed for work in 2023. Um, and as you know, um, Shin and I talked about this earlier this week, uh, we live in New England, and so unfortunately, we don't have 12 months in a year uh, for this type of work to be done. And so, uh, you know, the combination of only two vendors who can do the work, and then we can only really get the work done four months of the year, um, you know, didn't bode well for us. Um, we started the outreach process again in the fall of 2023, so like we were just like really hot on that and faced the same situation with the vendors already being committed for, for this spring, uh, the spring of 2024. Uh, so they were not able to meet our timeline schedule. And so, um, you know, again, uh, we are committed to that track renovation and the project team continues to meet with the goal of securing um, a timeline for the spring of 2025. So it certainly isn't uh, the situation that we would like to find ourselves in, 
Um, and I guess if anyone is looking to start a new business, uh, you might want to like learn how to install uh, turf and track fields because it seems like there's not a lot of competition out there. <laughs> and that's, uh, I have one more piece. Um, and the other piece this is uh, to share with you this evening, um, uh, this spring, uh, the Scarborough Education Association, the SEA, and central office leadership uh, had worked on um, uh, this document that you see here. Uh, the SEA came to us uh, wanting to partner on this project uh, in an effort to uh, really better inform parents about ways in which they can support their children's education at school um, and support the educators that work with their students. And so you'll see here there's, you know, um, some outlines around communication, collaboration, and how collectively we can grow that community culture. Um, and so at the time that this came to completion in the spring, it had been agreed upon that um, we would roll that out, if you will, at the start of the school year. And that is where we are. So um, so that is why I am sharing it with you this evening. Uh, we are making these into um, uh, posters. And um, these will be um, visible in um, office areas of each of the schools where parents convene. We'll also make sure that we include this in our first um, district newsletter. So, uh, you know, parents understand that uh, we have a real interest in having a genuine partnership with them here at school. Very good. Thank you, Diane. Are there any mm -hmm. questions for Diane? I have two. Um, the track and turf. Can we um, open, I, it, I, I'm, I'm saying this without too much of an understanding of the RFP process. Can we open the RFP up nationally? and solicit bids from outside of the region? Kate, I'm staring Kate down. Kate, would you like to speak to that? <laughs> would you like to come to the podium? <laughs> I mean, I, I understand we would likely need to, you know, secure housing of some sort. There, there's additional costs. I just wonder if the additional co the cost we would pay to um, bring in a crew from out of the area might offset the super specialized Cost that's here, and perhaps they're about even, and we can get the work done a little bit faster? It's a good question. Um, there's no reason why a vendor outside of our region couldn't bid on an RFP. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, what generally happens is that folks will mobilize in areas where they feel that it's easy for them to do the work. So that's why you end up having vendors from New England mm -hmm. be interested in work here. Um, one of the things that didn't really come out in this in this little report that um, Diane has given is the um, well we did talk about the specialized nature of the work. One of the big things that that has been getting in the way is the backlog of work that these folks have because of the pandemic, where um, they may have had they may have had a project that was scheduled for 2020 or 2021 that was deferred and they'd already made promises to those folks. And, the, and so there basically is a line um, at the toll booth, if you will. Um, so I'm not sure whether the national vendors, you know, whether vendors across the country wouldn't be in that same kind of situation. Um, with that said, you know, as a, anyone can bid, we have worked through co-ops um, and reached out to partners across the country um, it's really more of a practical consideration for the vendors themselves, right. where they're looking for work where you know their workers are close to home. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really a, a the type of industry where people are used to traveling and spending time away from their homes. Yeah. I will say that we have one vendor who is very enthusiastic. It's the same vendor who put in the turf. Um, they've been super loyal to us through the whole process, doing their utmost to try and make this work. Um, and we're continuing to talk with them. Their difficulty has been the subcontractors. 
because they need somebody to actually do the site work. That's not their job. Um, and they subcontract that out. And they do the specialty surfaces. So um, that was the biggest difficulty, you know, not to get too far in the weeds, but that was the biggest difficulty this last spring was that they reached out to several different subcontractors and those folks were all super busy as well. Um, but, you know, I'm a very optimistic person. I think you know that I always come to work expecting things to work out well and um, we're gonna keep after it. We're gonna get it done, absolutely. Thank you. Um, my second is more of a comment. This, um, this expectations that you've that put together, or not you, Diane, but you, mm -hmm. the leadership group in the SEA, I think this is a really great document. And I wonder if, in addition to the newsletter and um, the posters, I wonder if this can go in the younger kids. I, I, I Maybe I'm showing my age. I presume we still send out folders. Yes. Do we still send out folders? Yeah, we do. Can we? Can we print these out and put them in folders? And maybe for the older kids, we put it on the um, family ID, the site where we do our forms now for the for the older kids so that they can access it, so everybody can access it, even if they're not in your buildings. Yeah, those are great suggestions. Um, the other place uh, that I didn't mention that these are also going to live are going to be in the digital handbooks on the oh, website. Perfect. So That's perfect. Um, we're really just trying to uh, blanket that information mm -hmm. in multiple places. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that your suggestions are also great ones yeah, for us to, to consider. Perfect. Very good. Are there any other questions or thoughts for Daniel? All right, I think. Oh, did you raise your hand? Oh, sorry. Pardon <laughs> me. Pardon me. It's like Thank an option. <laughs> All right, agenda item 7.0 is the chair's report. Mine is really brief um, today. Um, we are in the summer months um, coming out. Um, as Diane mentioned, the district reopening is coming soon, and um, we do uh, wish everyone a good first staff day back at school. Um, when we meet again, school will actually already be in. Mm -hmm. So um, for the parents listening, you know, we wish them a, a happy um, start to the school year as well. It seems unbelievable that we're here already. Um, the second thing I had is we do have um, one open seat on the school board. Um, that seat is um, due to resignation and it is set to expire in, or not, ex I guess it's expired, to, to be up, to be done. The term is up in June of 2026. So um, by the time they, they would come on in November and the person would serve until June. Um, so if anyone is interested in a school board seat, um, the nomination papers are available in town hall. You can go by and pick them up. They are due back uh, with your signatures um, by the first Wednesday in September, which is the 4th. Close the business on the 4th. All right, if, you, if anybody is thinking about it and has questions about um, some important things to consider as you're looking at these seats is the time commitment, um, the, the work that's being done, what it's like to be an elected official. Um, I'm sure, I mean, I'm the gonna, money. I'm gonna speak to, yes, the, the pay. I'm gonna speak to every, I'm sure everyone up here is happy to speak to anyone who's who has questions. So we would love to, we would love to talk with you. Um, and then the third thing I have is that um, the committee, the committee's report, the board committee work um, has, uh, you know, takes a pause over the summer as well for those who aren't as familiar with our process. Um, so they don't meet as much. There's a couple that you will hear from. Um, negotiations is still ongoing. You'll hear from them. And then policy is still pretty pretty active. But the rest kind of take a break in the summer. So we will be getting started up as well now that the, the school year is back back in session. And that's all, that's all I have. All right. Agenda item 9.0, um, 8.0, our committee reports. Um, so we will start with communications. All right. So we are, we are next meeting is to be determined, but right now we're, we're just working on prior to prioritizing some tasks, calendar development and general planning and organization. Um, <laughs> we're working to put together a calendar. Um, the track update, I don't think I need to reiterate, but uh, Kate had written an email to us and uh, it was really a lot of great information. So um, 
I believe the communications committee will take that up and try to get it out to the wider community as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's all the squishy words are on there. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We're trying to really um, prioritize how we, uh, what, what we're going to do and not be so chaotic. <laughs> it was, uh, some learning curves in there last, last year with how, what we can take on. Very good, thank you. Are there any comments for Julian? All right, curriculum and finance back to back. Yep, well, we have not met as a curriculum <laughs> committee, so that is still being determined, so I have no updates for you currently. Um, but I imagine it'll be happening soon enough because school's about to start. So right now I'm sure everybody is really busy right mm -hmm. now, uh, making sure that everything's gonna go smoothly um, at the start of the school year, so. Yeah. Um, and then same, we have not met as a finance committee yet. Actually, I am um, gonna send Kate something tonight after our workshop uh, this mm -hmm. afternoon, uh, this evening um, with Steve and came up with a pretty good topic to, to have an overview of. Um, EDU 279, did I get that right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I understand that Alyssa's going to be meeting with Kate on Friday, so she's gonna get a review of, of some of the procedural things before we get started. So I'm excited to get back to our meetings. Perfect, thank you. Are there any questions for Jenna about curriculum or finance? All right, wonderful. Brayla, you're next with DEI. Um, yeah, the DEI committee has been on break. Our next meeting is September 10th from 6 to 7.30. Um, traditionally, we meet in the AV room at the high school, and it's also a hybrid meeting, so it's available online. Um, our membership subcommittee work um, has not continued, but will continue over the, over the summer. We're going to be looking for new committee members. Definitely have some um, spots to open up um, and talk about that, but um, we're looking forward to get, getting back at it. And you have the next two, so you just want to carry on? I'll and keep rolling. Yeah. Negotiations are ongoing. Um, we had two contacts, two contracts that are, which I said contacts in here, so it should be contracts, are close to completion. Um, we have ongoing discussions on the third contract. I'm fairly optimistic um, that things are moving along the way they should. So um, we have uh, meetings on the calendar through September, and hopefully we'll be done soon. Awesome. And you have one more. Policy committee. Um, <laughs> A lot going on. Uh, we have a second reading of BDG School Attorney Legal Services. You will see that at our next meeting on September 5th because um, it went through committee this week, so it wasn't in time to get on this agenda. Um, we're going through the Title IX policies. There was a significant change in Title IX um, legislation at the federal level, and we're bringing our policies into compliance um, with the, in, within line with those changes. And so we've gotten through three of them, which, again, you will see at our next meeting um, because we got through them this week. Um, we're continuing to move through that. Um, that's sort of taken our front seat because we need those. Those are really very important um, policies in terms of our like legal compliance, and so we need to get them in, into compliance now. Um, we'll get that done, and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled programming, which um, includes uh, transportation. We're taking a pretty deep look at the cellular technology use of de electronic devices at schools, K-12, through which I know there's a lot of interest in. Um, and then after we move through that, we're going to go back to uh, moving through the B-suite of policies um, to get those updated with the goal uh, of getting any policy that has not been looked at prior to 2020 uh, re reviewed and updated. Our next meeting is September 5th at 5.30 to 6.30. That's the next board meeting, business meeting for the board. Right. And it's hybrid and in person um, at the school board conference room. No, I'm going to do three meetings back to back, John. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> to doing three meetings yeah, back to back. No, it starts at three. Oh, okay. Three thirty. But yes, so that we will be in lots of meetings are happening on September fifth. It'll be a very meeting heavy day. It might be Friday. You have lots of updates. At the yeah, last I should have lots yeah. of updates. I hope. Yeah. Any questions about any of those? Any questions or thoughts for Fred? Comments for Fred? All right. Long range planning. What's that? Uh, we are working on, or I'm going to be emailing out to organize our first meeting um, and looking forward to looking at um, the facility needs as we continue to work on our building um, solution. Thank you. Speaking of building solution. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 
the the communications committee um, that is actively working on uh, various projects through the summer is going to be at Summerfest tomorrow, and then of course we are working on a phase two. So um, that is where we are right now. And you're going to read that next, right? Yeah, almost yeah. next. Yeah. All right, almost next. Okay. So yeah, catch them at Summerfest tomorrow. Any questions on that? We'll talk about the phase two separately, but any questions on Summerfest or the Kongs Committee for them? All right, very good. Any liaison reports? Anything from town council or? You have one? Yeah. Just have a reminder, um, this is not really legislative, but it's kind of, um, we, we are gonna be reviewing um, some, I forget what they're called, but the, um, changes to the MSMA. Oh, the proposed regulations. Proposed regulations. Resolutions. Resolutions, is it. Um, would you, it, it's important to review them and come with your thoughts next meeting to discuss them. Otherwise, uh, you're gonna be stuck with my thoughts, which is not, as we discussed, the board's thoughts. So, <laughs> so please take a chance to look through them. I know they're really, really dense, but um, it's important to make sure people have questions and we have a good discussion about what you want me to do because I'm gonna take my marching orders from this group. Um, and if I don't have any, that makes it harder for me to figure out what, what you always want me to do. There. I have a quick one, my, my first and last for the community center. <laughs> uh, the community center is done, meeting. So I came on and, and I guess it was fortuitous timing, I don't know. But um, they have written their final report and um, they are complete, they've completed their work. They are going to present their findings to the town council next Wednesday. Um, they have a workshop at 530. And so they will present um, what they found. Um, if you've not seen online um, on Facebook, I know it's on Facebook, I'm sure it's on the website, the town council website somewhere. They've got, um, uh, for lack of a better word, renderings of the building. It's um, where their proposed site is. If you've not seen it, it's right near Wentworth, the Wentworth School. Um, so we're to hear more about that next Wednesday if you're interested in hearing. Um, about that and attending the meeting, that would be that would be the time to do so. So that will um, effective, I guess Wednesday. That will come off of our list of liaisons um, rules. Well, yeah, that was the fastest I've ever served on anything. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And um, any other liaison reports? I was just going to say about the community center, really mostly from uh, the town council perspective, and they're working on the phase two dock as well. So that's it right now. Perfect, thank you. All right, agenda item 10.0 is general public comment. Is there anyone here wishing to make public comment about something that's not on the agenda? Let me just double check on, is there anybody? The feed is not working this evening. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Seeing none in here, um, I will close general public comment. 11.0 is new business. 11.1 .1 is the major capital applications for middle school, Blue Point School, Eight Corner School, and Pleasant Hill School. So I will turn this over to Diane to tee up. Yeah. So thank you for that, Shannon. Um, uh, we have been very busy uh, this summer. Uh, working on updating our four applications uh, for state funded projects uh, for those members of the public um, who may not uh, be aware. This is the first time that state funding has opened since 2017. Um, Scarborough uh, did not rate very highly uh, in, in during that time um, and uh, now that uh, these have reopened, uh, they reopened in May and all of the applications are due on August 30th, uh, we felt like it was really important for us to do our due diligence and to reapply uh, to see how we might fare with the state funding this round. Um, I think going into the process, um, the lead at the DOE communicated to us this was, was really just updating our application. Um, and I would say that um, his um, assumption of that uh, w could not have been 
understated mm -hmm. um, anymore because we have found ourselves spending countless hours um, uh, on these updates, if you will. Um, and, and that has consumed um, not just time, not just my time, but certainly um, Kate and Todd Jepson and you know, Ray has come on um, and learned a lot about where we are with the buildings of Scarborough uh, in, in a little bit over a month um, that he's been here. And uh, we also have had a lot of due diligence on the part of our building leaders. Um, and we met several times to really make sure that uh, there was the most up-to-date information in each of those applications, uh, which you should have received in your packet. Um, Part of the requirement is that boards do vote um, for us to be able to submit the applications. So um, uh, with a successful vote this evening, what we will look to do is we will follow the expectations as laid out, uh, which include submitting electronic copies of our applications as well as uh, a paper copy. What I did not include in your board packet was all of the appendices and supporting documents because I felt like uh, you probably didn't need that level of detail, but if you are interested in knowing what type of information will be included in the appendices, um, that will include um, all of our latest indoor air quality reports, our um, CIP work that we've conducted across uh, the affected schools uh, from 2017 to the current time so that they can see what we've uh, what we have attended to um, we will be submitting all of our roofing histories so that they know the work that we've done there uh, we will submit the long-range facilities plan although uh, that is a little bit dated at this point and a piece of work that I would love to see the long-range facilities committee um, update uh, we will include our 2023 enrollment study and all of our building floor plans. So um, the other piece that I wanted to mention this evening is that um, although all of these applications are due by August 30th, um, there will not be notification to districts made until uh, next June mm -hmm. of 2025. So what they will do is they will take this year um, and they have a school visiting team, and that team will go out and literally visit and score using uh, an assessment tool every school that applied for funding. Um, and then uh, we'll receive our scores, and we'll see where we fare. Um, again, uh, we're doing our due diligence as I, I hope when you read, you were like, oh my goodness, there's so much detail in here uh, because I believe there is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, certainly um, we're really looking forward to how we score. And uh, one other point that I would make is uh, there is a hold harmless provision as part of the building application. So although we need uh, to be very upfront with the state about uh, the work that we've done um, to improve our schools since our first application in 2017, we do not lose points for um, you know, trying to correct things. They, um, they ask that information very clearly so that uh, they're not just looking at the way our schools look today, but acknowledging that, um, you know, that, that we have spent uh, time, effort, energy, and local tax dollars uh, to try to improve uh, our schools to the highest extent possible. Okay. Um, First, do we have a motion to approve the major capital applications for the Middle School, Blue Point School, Eight Corner School, and Pleasant Hill School? So moved. Second. Okay, my first and the second. Any discussion? Any questions? Discussion for Diane? Uh, um, once funding, uh, kind of the points are assigned and, and we have our list, presumably most, a lot of towns and, towns and cities in the state are going to be applying, what, how many get funding? 
So that really depends on like what is that bucket of dollars that the state has for that. Um, if I were to look at the list uh, from 2017, there are nine projects since 2017 that were funded out of a total of uh, right around 70, 70 schools. Okay. Is it fully funded or percentage funded based on how much money they... Generally, the when has. a project receives state funding, it is uh, full funding for that school, right? Like there is a, a project in a community nearby to us right now that is not fully state funded, but that is because that district is choosing to address some other um, building issues at the same time that they're addressing an issue uh, that they had applied for state funding for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, this was the mechanism with which we funded the junior high a number of years ago. Is yes. that correct? Yep, for the 1996 project. So when I hear a lot of um, discussion about how we had a state, uh, we've, how we've gotten state funding for schools, this is the way that we did it. Correct. And so this is the only mechanism we have available to us to ask the state to pay for the school building when we're asked that we have, because I know I've been asked, I know we have been asked if we've explored every possible avenue to get funding for um, to build, to address our, the needs at our, our primary schools and our middle school, this is the only avenue we have. So and if we don't do this, then we aren't, we aren't even in contention for this money. Correct. And our highest, um, our, our most critically needed, uh, rated, it's like opposite, like you don't mm -hmm. want to be rated low on the scale because it means your school's in really, really bad shape. Mm -hmm. But our, our worst school or our highest on the list school was eight corners last time. I believe so, yes. And it was in the high 20s, almost like a little, a little under 30. I think it was 32. So it was number 30, 32. 32. Mm -hmm. So if nine of those projects are in the works, um, there might be 21 projects ahead of us. And again, those are assumptions that we're making. Because things can move. Um, right, in terms of, like, if none of those schools that were ahead of us came up with their own local solutions, right? Like, it's hard to determine all of that. Yeah. And things could shift depending on sort of on things that have been discovered since 2017, so environmental hazards, something that might become a yes. critical need immediately and yep. bring a school up Correct. more quickly than... Right. Like, there's not just an assumption that everybody moves up yeah. nine. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Does it hurt us to have had a state project prior? Does it, do we lose any, okay. No. With us applying as um, the three primary schools, um, but not yet having a solution as the, as a phase two, the building solution kind of is moving forward. Um, do we have any insight onto how that would be addressed if one of the three primaries were to be chosen for I, I think I like, off, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I, I think it's hard for us to kind of, you know, foresee the future or what that might look like. Um, I think, you know, we're certainly going to get into the phase uh, two plan for um, our local work that we've been doing here. And again, um, I don't think that it's my understanding that there's not an assumption that we would be seeking referendum in June. Mm -hmm. And so um, we would be getting uh, information about our status prior to a local referendum happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just finish up. Um, first off, the amount of work, the amount of work that has gone into these is pretty unbelievable. So thank you mm -hmm. to everyone on the team who has worked. These are um, I I guess in my mind I was thinking this was going to be a like five pager, and when I started opening these and reading <laughs> these, and they're nineteen pages and twenty pages and seventeen pages, and the amount of information in here is really really important for not only I think this board to know, but really for the community to know. And so I'm interested um, in potentially sharing these. I just don't know if, is that, is that okay? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's, you know, uh, you know, there's nothing, nothing disclosed in the right? application that says, you know, we're sworn to secrecy. I mean, I think this is a mirror reflection of the status of our schools. Right. And this is because when you start um, for any, for I know the community hasn't seen these yet. And 
when you start getting in here and you start reading about um, what's appropriate and what's necessary to educate our students and where we're lacking, mm -hmm. it's pretty eye-opening, even for me, who's been very heavily involved in this work for years, to go down an entire chart and see no, that nothing is acceptable in the school is pretty telling. Mm -hmm. And that's the case for every single application yeah. that I looked at. And so I think that this is something that um, would be really good for the community as a whole to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's fair enough. Yeah. All right, so we have a first, we have a second, we have discussion. Um, all in favor of approving the major capital applications for the middle school, for Blue Point School, Eight Corner School, and Pleasant Hill School? Uh, and it is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, agenda item 11.2 is the first reading of the school building advisory committee phase two charge. So the document is in, um, yeah, the document is in um, everyone's agenda packet. What I would like to do is tee it up first, and then I would like to take public comment, and then we'll we'll get into our business with it. Oh, when I first, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. Mm. Was there anybody who was wishing to make public comment on the major capital applications? Thank you. Okay. Now we'll get back into this. So I would like to tee it up first. Um, so this work was done um, over very many hours. Um, Alyssa, Jillian, myself, Diane, um, Tom Hall, Nick, Councillor McGee, and Councillor Scyther um, all worked together on this. Um, and the idea was we had phase two that we, we completed. Now how do we move forward? And so some of the major things that we really discussed was the size of the committee, given we would, that we would be bringing on a consultant at this stage. Um, we discussed very heavily the referendum date that Diane alluded to. We discussed what we thought um, that timeline would work, look like and um, where, where the, where we, what we wanted this committee to focus on. So I'm not going to read it word for word because everyone has it. But essentially what, we're, what we came up with is that the phase two work would work with the consultant and continue the work. So if you remember where phase one left off, they left off with four proposed solutions that they came to the table with. They asked to, they asked to carry forward all four. We, um, we voted to accept that. Town council voted to accept that. And so now we need a consultant to help kind of vet those out to the best of their ability to see what the committee believes would be the best option to bring forward for a referendum. Um, so the committees, one of the first things that we would have this committee do is select um, the consultant. So they would be involved in that work, um, the selection work. They would also be involved with selecting um, what we titled deliverables. So site selection, space needs analysis. Um, there, you'll notice on number three, there's a semi-permanent modular um, verbiage for number three under deliverables. Um, we did receive some feedback from someone on the phase one committee asking us to revamp that wording. Um, and so that's something we can consider um, when we are voting. But let me tell you what the um, question was, or the suggestion was. The suggestion was to change it from um, semi-permanent modulars to change the wording to prefab modular solution. So everywhere you see that in there, would it would be instead of semi-permanent modular, it would be pre, prefab um, modular solution. So that's one, the schematic design, which is the, con the concept, and then a probable cost statement, which would be your finance, right? And then your operating cost is um, not just looking at um, what it would cost for us to build a solution, but what is that anticipated long-term impact? So um, those are the... Those are the deliverables. Um, we expect, of course, the public to be involved in this process. We do um, expect the committee to check in with both bodies um, at four times throughout the year. That's further down in the document. But we have four dates set aside. Two of them are town council meetings. Two of them are school board meetings. The expectation is that we would attend um, the town council meetings, and the town councilors are invited to attend ours, you know, vice versa. 
but two oppor four opportunities for the community to really touch point with us and with the community and tell us where they're at in the process. Um, we also had laid an expectation down that we would incorporate um, the expertise of our staff because as you remember, phase one really um, the school staff wasn't as involved in that process. And so there's that expectation this time. Um, the membership, so I mentioned at the start of this, one of the things we really discussed was what the membership should look like. Um, one of the concerns is that as you bring a consultant on, how much, how many people should be in the room when you have a, someone you're paying to be there to help drive the process? So the phase one, when we ended phase one work, we were roughly at 50-ish participants. 50-ish um, members um, without knowing how many wanted to come back and if they all did or didn't um, but we weren't sure we had heard some mixed things what we decided to do um, was suggest 19 members so of the of the phase one committee the five subcommittee chairs so the subcommittees are enrollment benchmarking finance infrastructure and communication those five chairs would automatically come to phase two work. Four members of the leadership team. So um, the leadership team was the chair, the vice chair. Um, we had a, a secretary, and then we had a, a few other members that were non-elected officials. So four of them will come to phase two. <coughs> we will open up an application process for three residents at large, and then three alternate members so six more that would be invited to apply to be on the committee. And then there will be the two members of the town council and the two members of the board. So that's how we get to the 19. Um, alternate members are expected to attend meetings just as other members. Um, they are privy to all information. We would utilize their vote in the event that a member is absent. All right. Um, we would uh, establish what we, would, what we are calling an application committee. Um, the, this would be comprised of the BOE members, the council members, the town manager, Diane is the superintendent, and the chair from the phase one committee. So phase one committee chair was Peter Hayes. So he would now sit on this um, application committee, and that committee would determine based on um, applications received, um, they would they would select based on the application they received and the criteria demonstrated who would sit on phase two. Um, the second big thing was up for discussion. Um, let me back up one second. Uh, the, the reason the membership is a little bit different is because if you recall in phase one, we opened it to anybody who was interested in serving. So this deviates from the way we sat phase one. This is the deviation. All right, the referendum timeline was the second big piece. Um, we, I don't think it's any secret that we all probably feel the pressure to get something done. Um, the concern is that if we had tried to put in a June 2024 referendum date, we were already pushing up against the clock because if you, you know, the process to get, you know, town council has to vote on what goes to referendum and to get that done, that has to get in front of them by April. So when you start backing up, when we by the time we seat a committee and we select a consultant, we're already down the road pretty far um, to April, and we we haven't even started doing anything yet. So um, in light of that, we decided to just move it back to November of 2025. So what would happen is this committee will be set by September. Um, the uh, we can start um, we the when I say we, it's really. <laughs> It's really our central office staff and Kate. We can start a RFP process for the consultant. So all of that can get started while the committee is being sat so that when the committee is sat, we're ready to go with consultant selection. And then they can get to work right away because the deliverable for a final solution is June 30th. All right, you can see the forward process checkpoint dates. It's November. Um, that's likely a shorter update. November is, you know, not too far away. That is more of a where are they at in the process of selecting members, um, where are they at in um, the process of selecting a consultant, things like that, you know, more logistical update. Then there's a January, March, and May updates. Um, 
We have um, same officers, the chair, the vice chair, recording secretary. Those will be determined from the committee members by its members. Um, quorum and voting quorum will be 10 members that attend. Um, in meeting and records, they, the same responsibility that we have as a board will, will move through to the committee, meaning that they will record the meetings. They will allow for remote promote participation. The public is in, expected to participate. Um, we will follow, they'll follow Robert's rules. Everything the same is, is how we conduct our meetings. And then the last piece, because we did um, de determine that the smaller membership in phase two is important given the consultant work. Um, we didn't want anybody to feel that they couldn't serve if, if they wanted to be a part of this phase, but they weren't selected for the committee. We didn't want them to feel like they were out. And so what we've offered up is a note in here that the committee members can select people to serve as necessary. So like on a subcommittee, right? So for example, if we if this committee decides to have a communication subcommittee, they can bring people from phase one to continue that work, right? Or if there's a decision to have a finance subcommittee, they can ask people from phase one to come work on those subcommittees. So there's still um, an expectation that many of our phase one um, participants hopefully would want to continue on in the process. All right, are there any questions, like no discussion, but questions on what I just went over? Yeah. Just as a clarification point if for anyone who's watching the two phases very closely, um, we did have a five-person board on the SBAC phase one building leadership team. The reason it is down to four is because I have moved from um, into the school board seat. So um, that leadership team is down to four in this document. Thank you. All right. So we'll take a pause now. And is there anybody wishing to make public comment? Jim Pritchard, Maple Ave. I have a concern with the way the committee is being formed. I think that we're slipping back into the previous model that was rejected. I, my suspicious part of my brain is saying that the elected officials may have one of the projects in mind, um, and that is turning people off. Since this came out, I've had about 15 calls about the concept, and they were not good comments like, we told you what was going to happen. They led you to believe that they are open and everything, put the committee to work. In the background, they were working on other projects. And after I saw the numbers and who was sitting on it, I was leaning toward them being right. I will ask the elected officials from both this body and the council what they asked me to do in phase one. Keep an open mind and follow the data. For those of you that were at that, notice that I sat up front most of the time. Mm -hmm. I do that to watch people. And I, through some of the conversations, I watched the elected officials, their facial expression, the way they were moving in their seats and everything. They did not approve of what, what was going on. That's what I mean about being careful to going back to the old uh, consolidated school panel. So I'll ask this panel, and I will be asking the council the same thing. 
Keep an open mind. Follow the data. Uh, I'm concerned about the wording as far as the public's participation. The wording is a little confusing. As I read this, and I've only read it twice, I haven't studied it. I'm reading that the only time that the public can participate are on the four uh, dates that's in this process. I hope we're going to follow the same procedure that we did in phase one, where it will be zoomed and there will be a period for public comment either before or after the meetings. It's not clear in this document that that's going to be permitted. On deliverables, I would like to see the wording changed on semi-permanent modulus to add permanent precast concrete modules and change the wording from permanent construction to conventional construction that have the three options, the prefab, the precast, a permanent precast modules and conventional construction. I've heard through all the conversations I've had when we speak about the permanent precast, they are referring to the modules we currently have and they're completely different. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Anyways, is there anyone else wishing to make public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll close it. Do I have a motion to approve the first reading of the School Building Advisory Committee Phase 2 charge? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? So we are going to, I put a, a suggestion and we are going to change the, the, the modular construction, like prefab construction versus either conventional or traditional or I, I, don't, I don't know what the best word is. Yeah, I th um, we can offer up an amendment. Um, I just don't want to do that right now. Okay, if that's unless fine. Some will. Well, I, I, sh I shouldn't say that. If we, would you like to offer an amendment, or do you want to wait till maybe we have a whole list? Uh, a whole list of amendments? It sounds like we might have a couple potential amendments to discuss. Okay. Uh, I, I, I guess we could... Uh, a point of information. We can vote. <laughs> I, I guess if she brings up one amendment to change the wording, and then there's another amend amendment later, we would vote on it a second time? No, I think you should bundle your amendments. Right, like how? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bundle them. So we need to bundle them. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, the first is the semi-permanent modular um, language under number three. Um, under, I'm sorry, under no, deliverables number three. So changing that to... Um, Changing that name. Well, I think if you look at the text that follows the heading, mm -hmm. it, it uses the language prefab modular. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that it would make sense to use that language consistently. Right. Okay. <coughs> and, and also to change the, the next wording of um, permanent to conventional. Yeah, or, conventional or, construction. Yeah, whatever, whatever verbiage we want to use for for both of those so that they're equal. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so we do that. The other thing is the um, public involvement piece. Um, I'm trying to think about what was just said. Um, I, I think we definitely have the Zoom piece down because that's a number 10, meetings and records. So we, and we definitely spell out that they will follow Robert's rules. What I think we could add under number 10 is um, the expectation of public comment. Because I think that's separate from what the above, which is the public involvement. The public involvement is, um, is I, I see what was said during um, Mr. Pritchard's public comment. The public involvement bullet, the way I understood it, and Alyssa, you and Jillian, correct me if you miss, if you heard something different. I think the idea of that sentence or that paragraph was to make sure the community felt like they were brought along in the process. And so that is separate from what Mr. Pritchard is talking about, which is making sure we involve the public by in the meetings, right? Yes. So I think that we're best to best incorporate that if we go down to number 10, which is the last number. Um, we already say the committee shall televise all proceedings and allow for remote participation. I think that we can say the committee shall take public comment. At, at all meetings. At all meetings. Absolutely. Yeah. And then that would that would get us there. Yeah. Yeah. And I might suggest that in that last sentence that states it is expected that the SBAC two will follow Robert's rules to conduct meetings and proceedings, perhaps at the end of that sentence, changing that period to a comma and um, including the wording, including public comment because public comment is uh, an expected part of Robert's rules. Mm -hmm. And so it is not in addition to, but I think by uh, making it more explicit in the language that seems like that would address Mr. Pritchard's concern. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just had a requirement. Um, is there any other concerns, any other questions about any part of the document? The only thing, the only other thing that I might suggest in that same number 10, if the board's, you know, interested in entertaining my feedback, mm -hmm. um, would be uh, the sentence that says the committee shall televise all proceedings and allow for remote participation. I, I think that, again, uh, in an effort to clarify that we welcome members of the public um, to um, be present, that, that we don't need to necessarily say and will allow for remote participation, should we also say, and in person, just to be more explicit, right? Because I don't want to leave an impression for a member of the public that if you're interested, the only way that you can find out about what this committee is doing is to log on remotely, sure. right? Like people should be able to be present, um, you know, just as they are in our public meetings. And, and <clears throat> adding on to that, um, it, you know, it says televised, but, I, you know, we will also record those. I mean, that is something that, al that always happens. I don't, it, I don't know if we need to spell that out, but. It says it on there. Does it? It is expect. Wait, where did it go? Yeah. Oh, well. No, it doesn't something's say Something's happening to the document. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I think it just disappeared, but I think it's back. Okay, hold on. Okay, no, it's not in there. The committee shall televise all proceedings and allow for in-person or remote participation. Um, televise and record. Yeah, televise and record. Okay. Um, 
um, I did want to um, just talk to the board quickly about um, the concern about the public participation. Um, and I can understand we this is a deviation, right? We did um, initially make this committee um, open to, to all and we did, I mean, cards on the table, we did really ask the committee to come along and participate and to join us. And so um, I can understand that the change feels, um, you know, it, it can feel concerning, I guess is the right word to use. And it, it can, it can be, you know, we've asked you to trust us. We've asked you to come along. We've asked you to, um, really believe us when we say we want the community community to participate. And I want to be very clear that this is not the, the change in the size doesn't take away from that at all. We still are asking the very same things. We're still asking you to trust us. We're still saying this is a community that is led by the community. Um, the expectation is still for um, the elected officials not to control this process, not to have their finger on the pulse of it, to really allow the community to do the work to get to where they need to get to. So none of those expectations have changed at all. Um, the only concern was how do you have a room of 50 people trying to come to a consensus and a decision on a consultant? And how do we have 50 people in the room speaking to a consultant? You can see that it would get really, really overwhelming very, very quickly. And that is, in my mind, really what we were trying to, to control for, not to control for the community not to participate. All right, if there's no, uh, oh, Can I ask a yeah. All right, so trying to follow all this, because I, again, haven't sat on any of the building committees myself. Um, I do different types of committee work typically. Um, I just wanted to sort of get a sense of where some of the comments are coming from and some of the concerns, because I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, and I want to understand what, um, mm -hmm. what some of the concerns are. And I'm, as you all know, I'm blunt. And I don't like to like imply things. I want things said absolutely plainly so there's no con mistaking what was being said. So is there some concern that the folks that are automatically making it from the S back one, I don't know how you call yourselves, the building committee one, phase one to phase two, is there some concern about the folks who are specifically sitting in those seats that are automatically moving over, have some preconceived notion or are on some team, if there are teams, um, or have some sort of design that are going to control the process in a way that's going to make it per be perceived as unfair to folks in the community. And I'm asking the people who are sat on the committee because I've never, I've watched those meetings on Zoom. Um, I've attended a couple, but I, I have not participated in, to the extent that you have. Um, so is there some concern that we're waiting this committee in some way for some pre-designed um, outcome? <laughs> I, um, I, I think the long and the short of the answer is from the committee community's perspective, I'm not sure because I'm hearing the comment the first yeah. time that, that you're hearing mm -hmm. it, right? We're all hearing it for the first time together. Um, I, I will say that when the first phase was built out, we didn't, um, we did not tell the subcommittee chairs that they would be leaders moving on to phase two. That wasn't an expectation that was laid down to those. Well, that didn't people. exist until there was a phase two. For Correct. Me. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I, we I've read know, all the documents. Right. Like we had no idea yeah. where this. We yeah, didn't know if phase one would would get to a place where they could come forward with one solution. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what they would come forward with, and so we really, really tried both times. Um, I sat in the writing of both documents mm -hmm. as did Jillian, and both times we tried to really not be overly prescriptive. Again, the idea is that we're not putting our finger on the pulse of this; rather, the committee is kind of driving the work. Yeah. So. Um, there was no expectation that those leaders would carry forward. Okay. Um, however, they they were identified as leaders among their peers, and so you know that that plays into it. I'm not I'm not sure. I don't have concern that we are we are unfairly. I don't personally have concerns that we are unfairly um, building a, a committee that strongly favors one solution. I think okay. like when I think okay. of these people and who they are, 
Um, I quite frankly think that the nine of them voted for different solutions. Some of them okay. had different solutions that they recommended, right? I don't think they all, I don't think right. they all sit toward, I mean, I'm so, looking to you to see yeah, what you yeah, think. Yeah. I don't think they all steer, gear towards one solution. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense if we're, because again, I'm, I'm trying to respond to a concern that we're waiting this right. committee. My perception, having read the final documents, is that there are four proposals on the table and it was, a, I don't think it was unanimous, but it was fairly unanimous to bring all four of those forward. To, it was actually unanimous to bring all four of those to, our, to us to approve going forward, because I remember doing that a couple, few meetings ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to make sure that if there's a concern th um, that we're we're voting by placing specific people ahead of time, because that's the only way to shape an outcome that I could be, is to know what someone's already supported and then put particular people on the committee. And I want to make sure that we're not doing that, because right. that's not something I'm interested in doing. Um, and I want to make sure that if we're being, if people are concerned that we're doing that, that we're having this discussion mm -hmm. so that they know that that's not the, and that's not my intent. Um, and I want to make sure we're not doing it without me knowing, because I don't know, I don't know who brought forward, which I know what the outcome was. I don't know the players on each proposal. I never looked at the people behind the proposals. They weren't, that was not what I was interested in. Right. Sure. I do think that we have, um, kind of a varied um, support behind all topics. Um, and I think that um, by using the um, subcommittee chairs, we are kind of moving forward the subject matter experts. Okay. Um, so I think we have kind of a nice mix between um, utilizing kind of their expertise as the chairs and moving forward um, people who are open to multiple um, options as well as um, all options being represented. Okay, so there's representatives who are supportive of all options moving forward. And I don't remember everyone, but I believe off the top of my head there are representatives of all of them. As and long as they all choose to, sorry. As long as they all also choose to come back, yes. um, my understanding is that we have not had confirmation from all of those people. And we can't um, conscript it, people. What's that? Correct. We can't conscript people. This okay. is, there's no compulsory. Work. <laughs> well, and, like you yes, do what they want. To be fair, yeah. none of the work has been done yet because yeah. the bodies haven't voted, right? Yeah. The council doesn't take this up until Wednesday. Um, and we are setting this up, just to be clear, this is a first reading. Mm -hmm. We're setting this up to be a first and a second. The town council is setting it up to be the same so that we have plenty of time for feedback. Fantastic. Um, and I should also say that we did, um, Nick and I did co write an email and send it out to the entire phase one committee on Saturday, so they got it at the same time that the board received the information as well. So everybody has had some time to digest with the understanding and the invitation to please come here and to the town council meetings to share feedback as well. All right, so the people who were in the room who were sat through those committee meetings are satisfied that the folks that would be are proposing to move forward or their designee will give a fair shake to all four outcomes. So that we get good well, information. I don't know if that's a fair statement. Well, no, they're, they're going to evaluate all the outcomes that were put forward fairly. The one, um, I am not sure that the consolidated school would be represented. Um, I'm. Didn't was that Charlie's idea? Was he a s chair well, though? Well, Charlie was on the leadership team, so he he oh. comes forward. Correct. Then yes, I I feel fairly confident that as long as people move forward that we would have all four. So at least one person in the room, because I, I'm only interested in the four that came out of there. I'm not interested mm -hmm. in anything. So the four that came out of the recommendation, at least one person in the room can fairly evaluate that option. I just want to make sure, again, I want to make sure that if people are concerned that we're not considering particular options, that we're putting at least one person in that room at that table with a vote to to uh, be able to advocate for a position. And I hope they also keep open minds and that they can winnow these down because we're not voting on four separate projects. We need to get this down to something that's manageable. But I want to make sure that there's no concern. I'm hearing a concern that, that we are somehow not open-minded and we're not evaluating things. So the only thing that I can do, and this is my wheelhouse, is pr process, procedures, and make sure that if we have a fair procedure that every one of the projects gets evaluated fairly as a you know as as a proposal and then we get to the best proposal that way but if you're if you're confident that we're putting at least one person in the room who can talk about each proposal 
then I don't know what else we can do to make the process more fair. And I, that's what I'm invested in. I want a fair process so that we get to a good outcome. I think, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think what I'm hearing is instead of it being the, <laughs> instead of it being the subcommittee leaders, it's the ideas, the idea generators. But, because I can't confirm that voting, if you recall, the way that the voting worked and the way that that committee, dis it, it was a post-it note on a, po on a poster board. Yeah. I have no way of knowing if the five leaders on the, the subcommittee chairs, what they voted for. I have no way of knowing, right? I, I have no way of knowing what, what their interest is yeah. and what they served on. I, I, I don't, can't answer that. I don't care if we have the person who came up with the idea on the committee. What I do care about is that if we are advancing four ideas, we need to have at least one person in that room who supports each one of those ideas right. to be able to have an actual discussion about the four ideas. If we're actually advancing four of them, then all four of them have to be represented. If right. we're only, rep you know, or else we are waiting this. Because if we're not putting people in the room who care about that particular idea, then we're not putting people in that room who are going to have a fair discussion and evaluate all these proposals. And if we are tasked, our rec the recommendation that I heard was to consider all four of these. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this committee has to be able to do. Right. And I do believe in our discussions, we had discussed that. And we did not say specifically a, a representative from each group per se, but had put thought into, okay, you know, this person from the leadership team was a representative from that um, idea and oh this person is a representative and was the subcommittee chair of infrastructure and things like that but um, yeah because we would again we would have no way of knowing like where people's interests lied because we didn't we didn't ask people but we to still hands up and down vote but we did still I mean unless someone totally turned on their own group we did see who sat where in the last section of the time period when people were working on their proposals. I don't, I, I can't confidently say that. What I can confidently say is I know of one person who brought forth one of the ideas that is sitting here. That I only know of one. To what Frayla's getting at, I, I can only confidently say one. And that's Charlie because it was his idea. This The consolidated school was Charlie in April. And so, um, do you know James? Another? Is on the board on the leadership team, so would be on. progressed forward. He was the he had the one he, idea. He had the idea of the um, fourth school. Okay, or, or he um, was on that committee he at was, least. I don't really. He was the idea. He was one of the heads that merged two um, starting ideas into one of the larger ideas. Perfect. Um, the group. All right, now I'm. So then. <laughs> well, we had well, and the finance committee. Taking a step back, this is first reading to second reading. Mm -hmm. So, like, for as a first reading, I'm throwing sticky wickets everywhere because this is what I care about. I'm not opposed to advancing this document, sure, but I cannot support a document at the end unless there's a perception that it fairly um, will evaluate the process. Because, like I said, I have not grabbed onto people and ideas. I've just saw the four ideas, and if we want to make sure that every idea is evaluated fairly, we need to make sure that every idea has somebody in that room who's at least willing well, to give it a fair evaluation. And I hope they're willing to change their minds because we're not voting on four different projects ultimately. Well, we, we have to have people willing to evolve down into a more manageable number of ideas. Well, we're hiring a, a, a consultant. Like, the this committee will pick a consultant that will have to wade through all of those mm -hmm. options and lay out like a tr like a real information you know this committee worked really 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 hard and they were mm -hmm. amazing but the, even they said we were not the professionals here we need a professional and so i think some of these ideas may even evolve i i, I in the process of this with the consultants so i all I have to say is that somebody at the table has to be able to fairly, if we know that, if we send everybody in that room who's going to support whichever idea they support, it doesn't matter which one, four schools, um, the, the precast modulars, you know, we have a lot of really great creative ideas. Yeah. But if we send everybody in that room who we know really likes, pick whichever one, I'm not going to say one because I don't have, I don't, I don't, 
have one sure. um, that I'm supporting right now. But whichever one, if we send if we send ten people into a committee of nineteen that all we know are going to vote for this, then we are doing what what people are concerned about. We're awaiting this committee to have a pre designed outcome. I'm not interested in that. And the only way that I can ensure that there's a fair process and that every idea is evaluated fairly before we get to the next step is to make sure that every idea has a representative in that room. Can, can I, we add an addendum to that, you know, with the the makeup of, of the five, four, and three um, we that involved in that somewhere is somebody from... I would not be comfortable doing that today because I don't think we have enough information from what I'm hearing. But I think before second reading, that's a question that I would like to have more information about and more. I would like to be satisfied I don't even that know. people who look at this committee believe that they actually can fairly evaluate the projects. So I, I think it's challenging because walk me through the process as well as we're vetting this out um, without a document. Um, it's challenging to go to some of these um, committee head, um, committee chair, subcommittee chairs, and say, "Are you are you in?" and count them in until we have a working document. But how do we know who's going to sit with us to make sure all four projects are representative if we can't sign people on truly? So I completely agree that all four absolutely need someone in the room. I um, to give it a fair shake to speak to it. When the when the consultant says X, they can speak to that. Mm -hmm. When it specifically speaks to it, I, I couldn't agree more that all of the projects need to be represented and well represented um, by the people who started, started the idea from the ground. I just don't know how to ensure that can happen in a process where um, we're the, like building the document while unable to talk to people directly about it, I guess. Can I go back to the suggestion I had earlier? What if we add four members to the leadership, to this group? The four members being the four idea generators. I I'm completely That would satisfy that. me because yeah. I think the generator is the probably at least one of the better advocates for it. The person who can at least say, this is why I thought this idea, idea was good. And ultimately, if they can be convinced that another idea is better, is the best person to go out and say, here's why this idea is better. I, I do think the one caveat is I believe we may have gotten a few um, emails already from idea generators who have chosen to self-dismiss themselves from mm -hmm. wanting to be in two. So as long as it said or designee, or designee, or designee mm -hmm. then I would, I would be comfortable adding that. I just don't want to turn around at the end of this project and have somebody come forward and say, but you didn't fairly evaluate right. this, this, this yeah. project because you didn't put someone in the room who cared about it, I want to be able to say, we did. I, I mean, I'm trying to make, I care about this process being fair. That's my biggest interest right now. Really, the other, sorry, the other point that I would just make, um, you know, again, as a, an observer to most of the process or a resource provider to the yeah. team um, during that phase of the work is that um, as we were nearing completion of the work, each member voted to endorse their top two projects. I remember. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it wasn't that there was an expectation, you know, that a member had to commit to one of four projects. Mm -hmm. And I think that I also heard Jillian mention a few minutes ago that um, if you look at each of the projects on its own, there are a lot of nuances mm -hmm. that are not necessarily that unrelated amongst the projects. You know, so, so we're not necessarily talking about four discrete projects that are so completely different. That's true. That's true. I agree with that. I just don't want anybody at the end of this process Absolutely. to say you didn't think about making it as fair as, as possible. Yep. That is, again, that is my, that's the only thing that I'm invested in at this moment is a process that is object that is objectively fair and that is perceived as objectively fair. And I care about both of those things. So. Yeah, I mean, we can't really afford to keep at this time-wise. Correct. This is, I mean, I'm already. I'm comfortable supporting this document, but I will not support a document at the end if I don't think that it's, it is perceived as being a fair process. 
and I think it's going to be fair because I think I, I do believe I believe people do what they say they're going to do when they join. I don't believe people join committees with ill intent, and I'm going to ascribe good intent to people um, and hope that people who join this committee are invested in making sure we have the best solution for our kids because I believe that's why they join the committee. But I want to also be like objectively in, in in if in November 2025 I'm outside a polling station with a sign or some like not right you know without 300 yards away. Um, but advocating for this position, I want to be able to say to the person who's like, this wasn't fair, you didn't consider this, nobody, I want to be able to say, I did everything I could. I did everything I could to make this process as fair, as transparent, and as inclusive as many ideas as possible. Because that was one of the big critiques that I heard last time. And I, I'm not, you know, I, I do, I care what people think. Um, not because of that, but because it's because it, what I do know is that this project is not going to be successful unless the community does feel like it's fair and that we did consider everything. And so the best thing that I can do at this point is, in addition to keeping an open mind and following it, which I am doing, is to also ensure that I the only the only thing that the thing I bring to this table is governance. <laughs> like it's like my strength, right? And is make sure that I can make this process as fair as I can make it. And I know. We don't have time and we're rushing, but I'm, I don't want to rush and, and and stumble because we don't have the power to get to the end. Janet, hmm? can I make a suggestion? Um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. We can we can I can talk to you afterwards for sure about it. So just hang on, hold that thought for me. Um. Okay, so I think, um, okay, so where we're at right now, we have a change in the language about the um, semi-permanent modulars we're going to, um, oops. Can we go to precast modulars? Because yeah, I think there's an issue with prefab modulars. So I think there's a difference between precast and prefab. Okay. I think we did get an email yeah. about the specific wording as well. I, Was, think it I, I think that we could go with factory constructed versus conventional because regardless of there's multiple different methods. Correct. Not oh, that is true. There is multiple different method, yeah. methods. So okay, factory constructed modulars and then um, what did he say? On-site, off-site construction. Oh, that, that, oh that, yeah. That, that okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah, okay. all right. So let's um, hold on. say that one more time. <laughs> off-site construction versus on-site construction. So you're really looking at the construction mode as your C there, or three, and then. Could, could we, could. So would the title, hold on one second, Jillian, would the title be off-site versus on-site constructed? I would do construction mode. Yeah, but could, construction. could we just do various construction modes? Probably like better. versus, you know, you know, considering various construction modes versus all this Examples prescriptive. Yeah. off-site, on-site. Yeah. So you're not various, even limited to those two. Right, I think right. Better. Okay, consider various construction modes like off-site or on-site? Yep. Is that what you said? Yep. Or versus, or however you want to do it. On site construction, yep. Or on site construction. Okay. Okay. Consider various construction, or are we assessing the pros and the cons of construction of various construction? Is that yeah. really what we're doing? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. That was great. I know, I'm going to just delete it. Okay. All right. So it would be construction modes would be the title. Assess the pros and cons of various construction mo mo modes, like off-site or on-site construction. Is that... Describe it well? Okay. So we have that edit, um, and just so everyone knows what we'll do with this, we'll vote on this tonight. I will, um, I'm going to share the public comment we received tonight and then our suggested changes with 
um, town council with um, Councilor McGee, and um, he'll be able to then have this conversation with the council on Wednesday. So we have that change. We have the membership change, which adds four members. I'm calling them. I, I think this is likely the best phrasing, but if not, I'm happy to change it. Um, four members of the SBAC Phase One Solutions Subcommittee chairs or their designee. I think that suffices. Isn't that good? Yeah. Okay. So we have that change, and then um, down at the bottom, number ten for meeting and records, we've added. Um, the committee shall televise and record all proceedings and allow for in-person or remote participation. And then it is expected that the SBAC will follow Robert's rules to conduct meetings and proceedings, including public comment. Oh, and quorum is changed. Can someone do the calculation for me quickly? Because the quorum will change. 13. Thank you. Shannon, I think you also meant to put in that you would record also, televise and record. Yeah, that's in there, televise and record all proceedings. Okay. Well, but the three alternates don't vote. So now you're at 20, so it would be 11. The alternates only vote if one Someone's of the absent. members is absent. Well, we're but adding if you back 20, out the yeah. three, then you're at 20. What three did we remove? The well, the alternates don't vote unless one of the members is absent. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't. Okay. So it would be 11. This is why I don't math either. Yeah, it's 11 members. For the 11 is quorum? Yeah. Okay, so we have 11 members for quorum. I so said that would be the other chair. Okay, is there any other discussion? Are you verifying? Where did we move on quorum? quorum? 11. Don't ask me because I don't math. 11. 11. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Sorry, <laughs> is there any other discussion? All right, so we have a first, second um, discussion. All in favor of approving the first reading of the School Building Advisory Committee Phase 2 charge as we have um, edited. Point of order? Yes. So this is just going to approve what we've done. You're not on mic. So the, um, this, this vote will just move forward the document in order for a second read in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. No changes and when we refer to it in two weeks it will obtain whatever changes the town has as well or the town will consider the ones the town makes at that point mm -hmm. yes if they yes. vote down any of the things that we have added then it come, it'll come back it'll come back as town council has voted as well okay thank you very much point of order do we need a motion to amend the document um, or do we not? No, I think we're okay to just say as 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 amend as we've amended tonight, because this is the first read. This is just the first reading. Do you concur? Yes. Okay. All right. So, all in favor of approving the first reading of the school building advisory committee phase two charge as amended tonight? Oh, it's uh, unanimous. I couldn't land on the word. Thank you. <laughs> All right, 11.3 is appointments. I'm going to do two of them separately in one group all bundle. So the first one is 11.3.1, the Wentworth School Assistant Principal. Yes, I'm really excited this evening to share with you uh, this nomination and bring this forward to you. Gabrielle LaPerriere, who's uh, seated next to Kelly Crosby this evening, uh, for those of you in the room, has been selected to fill this position due to a resignation. Ms. LaPerriere earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in political science with a minor in education from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her Master of Science degree in educational leadership from the University of Maine at Farmington. 
She began teaching first grade in Charlotte, North Carolina before moving back to Maine to continue teaching first grade at Lisbon Community School. Ms. LaPerriere has worked as an assistant principal in RSU 40, as an interim assistant principal in the Brunswick School Department, and most recently as principal at Dresden Elementary School. We are very excited uh, to nominate uh, Gabrielle this evening and have her assume that leadership role at Wentworth School. Perfect. Um, do I have any discussion? Would you like to come up? Sure. <laughs> You're welcome to come up. <laughs> I don't have too much to say other than I'm just super appreciative for the opportunity to join the community here at Scarborough, and I look forward to learning from Kelly and my other colleagues as well as the staff at Wentworth and get to know, of course, the students and the families as well. So thank you again for your time and consideration during this process, and thank you to the interview committee too. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, do I have a motion to approve the Wentworth School Assistant Principal? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Second. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Well, I'm point of order. I need to know who said first. I did. She, she beat him. No, she didn't. <laughs> she never, no one will ever. No, no, I seriously need to know. She beat him. Thank you. Oof. And who's second? I'm sorry. I don't even know who's second. Second, Michael. Second. Jenna. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, any discussion? I hope I don't get any phone calls for y from you <laughs> <laughs> when my kid comes to you guys. Sure Congrats. <laughs> Those of us with strong-willed children have to leave these caveats when we're <laughs> when we're in our board myself, meetings. So I can with that. Yes, here we are. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, any other any other discussion? Welcome and congratulations. Did you vote? Um, no, we're about to right now. All in favor of, a, of approving the Wentworth School Assistant Principal as presented. Perfect. It is unanimous. Thank you and congratulations again. Congratulations. Thank you for joining us. All right. I'm going to bundle 11.3.1, the Wentworth School, no, 11.3.2, the Pleasant Hill School Special Education Teacher, 11.3.3, .3, the Eight Corner School Kindergarten Teacher, 11.3.4, the Eight Corners School Grade 1 Teacher, 11.3.5, the Wentworth School Resource Room Teacher, and 11.3.6, the Blue Point School Grade 1 Teacher, and 11.3.7, the Blue Point Special Education Teacher. Um, I want to bundle them, and is there a motion to approve those hires as presented in our packet? I'll move. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> All in favor of hiring? Thank you. It's been unanimous. Thank you. Okay, 11.3.8 is the fall coaches. This is the added um, fall coach roster that is in our materials. Is there anything else to add to the coaches? No. Um, do I have a motion to approve the fall um, 2024 coaches roster as presented in our materials? So moved. Second. Jeez. Is there any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? All right, it's unanimous. Thank you. Um, and if there are no objections, I will, 12.0 um, is adjournment. If there's no objections, I will adjourn at 8.45 p.m. So moved. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>